We continue on with our study of 2 Timothy. We're in the first chapter, and where we left off, Paul was just encouraging Timothy not to be ashamed, but to have courage and to guard the good deposit that's been entrusted to him. Well, when we pick it up with chapter 1, verse 15, and on into chapter 2 today, there's a theme that we're going to come back to that Paul is admonishing Timothy to have, and that's courage. But let me give you an example, first of all. In our family, we have a variety of anniversaries that we celebrate. And by anniversary, I just mean days of celebration. It doesn't have to be my anniversary with Trudy in our marriage, although that is certainly one we celebrate. But I mean birthdays and special days. Well, one of the special days in our family is October 30th. October 30th, seven years ago, was the day that Trudy and I went to court to argue for Alexandra to be our daughter, and to adopt her. Her name at the time was Alexandra Alexeevna Novozhilova. Did I say that pretty well in Russian? Alexandra Alexeevna Novozhilova. I remember it very well. And that day was a special celebration because after preparing our case and making our statements to the judge and the judge uh, sending us out of the chambers and then 20 minutes later bringing us back and saying, I am awarding you Alexandra, only her new name is Alexandra Hope Dick. We kept her first name, but we changed her middle name to Hope. And of course, we changed her last name to mine, to, to Dick. And so that's a celebration for us every year. Well, one of the many things that I've told you about Sasha, and I tell you one more now, is that when we first got her, she did not understand fear. She had no sense of fear, and I'm not sure if that's typical of orphan children or not, but what I would do, I would play with her in very aggressive ways. I would take her, she was very small, very tiny, I would throw her up high into the air, and I would catch her, and she would get this big smile on her face, and she would laugh. And she couldn't say words, but you could tell she was saying, do it again, do it again. So I would throw her up in the air, and I would catch her, and Trudy would say, be careful. i say, I'll, I'll be careful. Then I would take her, and I would flip her and do a somersault in the air, and I would catch her. And she would laugh, and she would smile. She had no fear. Uh, she had no fear of water. We were on a family vacation with uh, my parents and my brother and sister and their family. And we got to stay in a motel that had a swimming pool. And so Sasha had only been with us for about two months. And so I'm sitting on the edge of this, this little hot, oh, there's a hot tub and a swimming pool. So I was sitting in the hot tub with her and we were playing. And I started talking to my nephew. And all of a sudden I realized that Sasha was gone. And I looked to the left and she had gotten up out of the, the, the whirlpool, the hot tub, walked across to the pool sat down on the edge of the pool and jumped into the water. And your heart goes, Sasha, what are you doing? And we got up and my nephew and I, we jumped and we picked her up out of the water. She was under the water for about two seconds. And we lifted her up and you would think that she would cry and she'd go, oh, but she didn't. She, she wiped the water from her eyes and she got this big smile on her face like, that was fun, let's do that again. Sasha, that's dangerous, you could have drowned. She didn't have any fear. Now, over the years, she has actually become the opposite. She has developed some fears. Like, if, if Sasha were here with me, with all of you in this class, she would be afraid. She would be glued to my leg because she would, she would just say, I want to be with you, Daddy. I'm not sure who these people are. And I'd say, Sasha, they're okay. They're my friends. But, Daddy, I just want to, I want to be with you. I want to sit with you. So from having no fear to a place where she is very shy and she's not sure what to do, sometimes we have to encourage her to say, Sasha, it's okay. You can be with them. They're my friends. They're safe. You're going to have a wonderful time. What a person in a situation like that needs a little talk to say, Sasha, you can do this. It's okay. You don't need to be afraid. What Paul does with Timothy in this section of the letter is essentially that, Timothy, you don't need to be afraid. It's okay. Bad things are happening around us. I'm in prison. It's cold. It's dark. It's lonely. But I'm not afraid. Timothy, you don't need to be afraid either. We've been using the image of navigation as if our life or our church is like a ship and we, we navigate away from some things and we navigate towards some things. 
what we're going to see in this section is we're going to navigate toward courage. That what Paul suggests for Timothy to have courage is something that you and I should and must have as Christians and as our churches. So I'd like to have you take your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read verses 15 through 18 of chapter 1, and then we're actually going to read the first seven verses of chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, and then chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This is what it says. You're aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered emphasis. Chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust a faithful man who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. And as I said, what Paul is encouraging Timothy is, Timothy, I want you to have courage. Now in that section that closes out chapter 1, he's essentially saying, Timothy, I want you to have the courage to stay. I want you to have the courage to stay in Ephesus. I want you to have the courage to stay involved with me. Did you see what had happened? It says, you are aware, this is verse 15, you're aware that all who are in Asia turn away from me. Asia was this large region of area in which the city of Ephesus was. He said, Timothy, you know what happened. Everybody who used to be a part of my team Everybody who used to be with me from the area in which you serve, they've all abandoned me now. And he even names two people. Can you imagine what it would be like to read your names in the Bible? And say, wow, if my name were in the Bible, I would be so excited. I would be so humbled. I'd be so excited. I'd be so proud. I would have all kinds of emotions. But what if your names were written in the Bible criticizing you? So for 2,000 years, people have been reading of these two men's names. Can you imagine how embarrassing that would be? I think he, we don't know why he names these two men, and honestly, we don't know anything about them except that we know that Timothy would know who they were. And they become an example to, from Paul to Timothy to say, Timothy, everybody left. In fact, you remember those two guys? And I bet Timothy was thinking of situations with these two men. He's going, yeah, I remember what they did. <laughs> they were big fans of your Paul when things were going great, but when things started to go downhill, they weren't on your team anymore. I was saying in the previous lesson that I like, I like certain sports teams. There's a certain baseball team now this summer, a couple of football, to American football teams in fall. It's lots of fun to cheer for a team that's in first place. It's not fun to cheer for a team that's in last place. Lots of people love the Apostle Paul when, when he was building churches and going to different towns. A lot of people hated him too, but a lot of people followed him. But now that he's been arrested, now that he's in Rome, now that he's in prison, in this dark cistern underneath, people are saying, um, I don't want to be associated with him anymore. I don't want to know him anymore. You know, that was kind of fun while it lasted, but you know, it, what hurts the most is when people that you had a relationship with do that to you. One writer said it this way, he said, to be rejected by the world is not pleasant, but to be deserted by fellow workers in the service of Christ is particularly painful. To have those you have spent your life spiritually nurturing turn away from you and sometimes even against you, is heartbreaking to the extreme. 
Have you ever had a friend, a close friend, who turned their back on you? Maybe you were childhood friends when you were three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, and you were growing up together, and all of a sudden, when they got to high school, or when they got to university, or when they got married, all of a sudden, something happened, and they didn't want to be with you anymore at all. The break was complete, like from night to day or from day to night. And they said, I, and they may not even have said anything to you, but by their actions, they were saying, I don't want to be your friend. I know we were friends for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but I don't want to be your friend anymore. That hurts so deep. To have a brand new acquaintance do that to you, it hurts a little bit. But when a friend does that, I mean, think about it. Paul had spent three years in this city. He had developed relationships. He had started churches. He had done amazing things with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, as he gets into more trouble and he's arrested and people say, well, we can't be associated with him. They're going to arrest us just like they did him. We're going to end up in prison. We're going to end up losing our heads. We can't be associated with him. That hurt Paul to the deepest part of his being. And these two men have done that to Paul. But, that was the negative example. There's a very positive example that comes next in verse 16. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not afraid of my chain. You know what that tells me? I don't know if this man lived in Rome or if he came to visit Paul in Rome. But he found Paul in prison and he said, I'll take care of you, Paul. I'll bring you whatever. I don't know what he was allowed to do. Maybe I'll bring you something to drink. Maybe I'll bring you an extra piece of bread. But he took care of it. See, the thing when Paul was arrested and he brought to Rome, it wasn't as if there was a big billboard out on the highway that said, the Apostle Paul can be found in this location. There was nothing like that. In order to find where this particular prisoner was, he would have had to ask a lot of questions. He would have had to make inquiries and say, does anyone know where this particular prisoner is? It would be embarrassing. Why do you want to know? Who are you? Are you a follower of his Christ? What would you say? That there was a cost for Onesiphorus to pursue him, but he said he wasn't ashamed, Timothy. He wasn't ashamed. Verse 17, he arrived in Rome. He searched for me earnestly, and he found me. He looked hard, Timothy. He didn't give up. He pursued me. Verse 18, may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. Perhaps the day when Jesus Christ comes again, or the day, of, the day of, uh, of calling us home. But on that day, may he be granted a special blessing of your mercy. He says, and you know well all the service he rendered at Ephesus. He was the one person in the church in Ephesus that said, Paul, I will stand by your side. I will not abandon. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the kingdom of God please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. I remember one of the most difficult days of my life when I felt abandoned. It really wasn't by people. But I've told you that before I became a pastor, I was a farmer. I farmed with my dad and my brother, my grandfather and my uncle. We were part of a, a, a fairly large farming operation. And there was a period of years that were very difficult for farming. And my brother, who is younger than me, but who was married a number of years before I was and had four children before um, he had four, his fourth child was born shortly after our first one was. So he, he already had several children. He grew so discouraged by farming that, that one year he announced to my dad and me, I want to quit. I can't do this anymore. And my dad, who was at an age where he was close enough to retirement, said, boys, I think we all should quit. Why don't we farm one more year? We'll get everything in order, and then we will move on to something else. So, we began to look for opportunities. And Lord, do you want us to be in ministry? And, and he did. And so I've, I've told you how we came to Bethel Church and we've served there. But one thing remained, that when you have farming equipment and you have machinery and you have 
farm things, there, we have what we call an auction sale. So the spring after we quit farming, we had all of our machinery lined up on our farm. And people came to, to buy the things that we had had. And, and we have what's called an auctioneer. And he has people bidding on things. And the price, he starts down here. And you hope that it sells up here. It was one of the loneliest days of my life. I hadn't wanted to quit farming. I wanted to be a farmer. I was happy in the church. I, I enjoyed what we were doing. But I felt like a failure. And all of those farmers were looking at my equipment, my tractor, my combine that I had worked hard to maintain and to keep clean and to, to take care of. And, and they were looking at my things. And I knew that they were talking about me and they were saying things about our family. And it was like there was a knife in my heart. I remember my little nephew. He was about eight years old at the time. And in all of the busyness of that auction sale day, I remember seeing him. I can still see him in my mind's eye. He was sitting on the, the steps of our combine up about 10 feet off the ground. And he was sitting there with his hands, his chin in his hands, looking like he'd lost his best friend. And I nearly started crying because what he was doing was how I felt in my heart. I felt abandoned. I felt alone. I felt sad. I felt depressed. The day after our auction sale was, was over, I went back to church and I, I resumed my work. And I knocked on the door of the, the lead pastor and I said, I'm sorry. I said, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I can't read. I can't pray. I can't study. I, I don't know what to do. And he said some very wise words to me. He said, Bruce, you need to understand that what you've just gone through is a death. Nobody died, but something died. He says, you're grieving. There is a sadness inside of you. He said, I don't, you don't have to work today or tomorrow. If you need to take some time, you need to grieve because this is like a death. There's a separation. Some wonderful, wise words. And I think that's what Paul was experiencing here with the people who abandoned him. It felt like a death. He had served them. He had loved them. He had planted churches there. And only Onesephorus was there. At least there was one. One who cared. And sometimes that's all it takes. Maybe you have broken relationships and broken friendships. You would say, if I only had one person who would stand with me, I would be okay. God, would you give me one? Timothy, I know that if you were here, you would find me. But of all the people that I served in all those places, everyone's abandoned me. Except me. But praise God for that. Praise God that Jesus Christ still loves me. That I don't feel alone in this place. That he is with me. So Timothy, I want you to have the courage to stay. Stay in Ephesus and serve. And if we have a chance to see each other, praise God. But if not, you must have courage. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at